Brought to you by ES Myoplex Polar Hoka One On A Velo Fix. Every one of our athletes today receives a Velo Fix certificate. Norma Tech Four Seasons Hawala Lai. We'll be doing our championship edition. Amy O Power Breather. Please join me in welcoming our three time Ironman world champion, Marinda Carfrey. <laughs> Rini? Bob? Seems like we just did this a few hours ago. I know. It feels like a little bit, yeah. I love that. Mm -hmm. Hey, so all week long over at the Polar booth, they have been doing a contest for someone to win the ability to come out to our championship edition on Sunday at Four Seasons and to bring a guest and to receive a Polar V800. And we have our winner, and she's also a huge Marinda Carfrey fan, could we have Karen Abbott? Where is Karen Abbott? A round of applause, everybody. She's coming to Four Seasons. Love that. Thank you. All right. Sorry, Jim. My husband's a Garmin athlete. I'm a polar, but... Um Sorry, my husband's a Garmin athlete, but we're converting her to a polar. There we go. There we go. I Thanks, love Karen. that. Yes. Thank you, Karen. Very exciting. So, Renee, is it hard not to be racing here? Um, just had a baby yeah. a few weeks ago, so no, what the heck? I, I did my first run a couple of days ago, and making it through 20 minutes of running on Lee Drive after having a baby was enough for me to realize, yeah, it's okay that I'm on the sidelines this year. And being a mom, greatest thing ever? So amazing, yeah. You can't really explain it to anyone who hasn't got babies, but, um, yeah, she's, she's the best thing in my life. Love that. So, we were talking to Siri a little bit ago, and... I mentioned to her how uh, last night when we were talking, when you were 1430 down and you're running along and there's your coach on the side of the road going, you're in the best place, you're perfect. Yeah. And you were like, what the heck's wrong with you? Yeah, yeah. But she was saying, I wanted her to get out of her head that I'm having a bad day, I'm 1430 down, I'm never gonna catch her to basically, wait, maybe I'm okay. <laughs> I don't know if she got me out. It was more like there's something wrong with my coach. Um, I, I don't think she can do math. Because um, <laughs> it was really in the first, I mean, I saw her, I came up Polani and turned right on Kuokini. So it was like in the first like, 400 meters that I saw her. And she, she was like, you're in the perfect position. And if you know my coach, she's like jumping up and jumping down, up and, yeah. down and jumping out of her skin. And I'm like, don't get so excited. Like, this is not good news. <laughs> 1430 is not good news. But um, no, I, I soon after that, kind of got out of right. you know, that negativity out of my out of my head and started to to do the best I could with every step of I had left in that marathon. You sort of have the two voices going on, right? The one voice going, okay, you're in eighth place. Yeah. You're pretty close to being top five. I've never been off the podium here. Yes. That's still possible. Yeah. To the, I can't believe this. I'm having this awful day. I had this great day last year. How do you balance that? How do you basically tell that other one just to shut up? Yeah, I think... Um, yeah, as a professional athlete, that's part and parcel of being out there. You have the negative voice there, and, and it shows up in every race at some point. Yes. And, uh, you know, in, in 13, I had probably everything just went perfectly. I felt good. I felt strong. It didn't really even hurt. It was just one of those days where things flowed beautifully all day, and then I was going through a tough day. Right. Um, and mentally, it was tough. Physically, it was tough. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't perform, and I think over the years you learn time and time again it doesn't matter if you're feeling bad you still can perform um pretty well on those bad days too so um and not not saying i had a bad day in 14 because i certainly had one of the a greatest legendary performances days. of my career but um in that moment it just felt like i wasn't performing to my ability and it felt like you know i felt kind of like a failure but um yeah i mean some i think sometimes i have the conversation in my head and it doesn't really impact how i'm performing i'm still running as fast as I should be running right it's just more it's harder when you're negative in your mind so it's easier when you can turn that negative into a positive and and I did that by saying okay well now we're just focusing on getting in the top five and and then that was top three and all of a sudden I'm walking on clouds and happy and um you know once you start turning that around and you have a positive mindset it makes the day and it makes 
what you're doing feel a lot easier, even though it's just the same as it was when you had that negative mindset. Right. Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting because a lot of people see you now as you know very successful. You've won three titles. You've won a lot of other stuff. Uh, financially, you do okay, but they don't see those years where you're looking at events going. If I finish top three, I might be able to pay my rent this month. You know that type of stuff. Yeah. Take me through some of those that those early years of, of racing, trying to be a professional and making a living. Yeah, I mean, I started racing in basically 2001. I, I was on my first Australian junior team, and fortunately, I was on the Australian Institute of Sport team. So, I mean, I don't, I'm one of six kids. I don't. My mom didn't have a lot of money. We grew up on a farm. Um, pretty humble beginnings, yeah. but. Um, Fortunately, I was on the Australian team and, and got funded to, to travel internationally and race a little bit, but I wasn't bringing any money home. I wasn't, certainly, the bank balance was generally very low or zero. Um, and so I didn't really start making money in the sport until around 07 when I won the 70.3 World Champs and, and still it wasn't a whole lot of money. Um, so initially, yeah, I was going from race to race and racing for prize money. I didn't have any sponsorship dollars and it was, okay, this, this race has $5,000 for first, 3,000 for second and 150 and, and um, 1,500 for third and you'd be like okay well if I get third then I can cover my flight and I can cover my car and maybe my accommodation but I need to really get second or first if I want to pay the rent and, and um, be able to eat normal food until the next race and that was kind of how I went from race to race and I don't want to take that back I think that that really taught me how to how to have to win right. it, may, it, it makes it you know it when you go to a race going, I need to pay the rent, and yeah. I need to get third to pay the rent, that's a little different than, you know, when I, eh, third's fine, fourth's fine. You, no, you no. couldn't handle fourth. No, absolutely not. There was no choice. Um, and I think that, yeah, that elevated my game to a point that I don't think I would have been able to get to if I had, you know, money and... Right. And, um, and it, didn't, it didn't matter, but because it mattered so much and I had to win or I had to finish second or I had to get on the podium, um, I did get on the podium and that, that, that um, built everything else. It definitely did, yeah. So junior athlete, you move into, you know, you, 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 Siri was talking about when she first met you, it was like, okay, I want to go do Ironman. And Siri was like, no, it's, it's too soon. And she says, I don't think Rini was very happy with me because she wanted to do Ironman. But when all of a sudden the 70.3 Worlds came along, and that, I think it was the second year of that, that you won in Clearwater, and that got you a ticket here for 2009, yeah. and it meant you didn't need to do a full before coming here. Yeah. But you guys were able to spend basically two years focusing on this race. Yeah. And that's, well, that was the build, right? Well, no, I, honestly, I feel like I spent 10 years focusing on this race. Yeah. Um, I didn't, you know, and kind of, 99 I started the sport and sort of very quickly realized that I was a long course athlete um, but yeah basically 10 years later I ended up here in Kona and, and I think all of that preparation was for the big for island and you know when I started working with Siri it was about 05, 06 and I'm like okay I'm finished with, 70, with um, Olympic distance racing I want to go long course and she's like I think you can still do both and initially I did do both but my heart was with long course yes. and as you mentioned, fortunately, it was the perfect stepping stone from Olympic distance to 70.3s because that series popped up and all of a sudden there's some money involved yes. in, that, in that sport and an opportunity to try and win a world title in that distance. So that became my number one focus and a great stepping stone onto Ironman. And um, yeah, as you mentioned, I, I got the spot in 07 and obviously then it really shifted to focusing on Ironman. But I feel like it was basically 10 years of, of triathlon for me before I stepped toed the line in an Ironman. What's fascinating is here, Siri Lindley is a 2001 world champion, right, at the Olympic distance. Mm -hmm. And you were someone who won 70.3 worlds. Yeah. And you guys are coming here to Kona, both of you for the first time, yeah. right? Here's the Olympic distance gal who's coaching the 70.3 gal to do an Ironman. And there were no expectations for you guys. And, mm -hmm. But for you, there were. You yeah. guys knew. Yeah. You knew, but other people really didn't. Um, I feel like we didn't fly on the radar that first year. I, th I hope that we would, but I, I mean, I got called up to the press conference in that first year in 09 because I was a 70.3 well, world, world champion. champion right. and, and I think at the time they were just looking for someone to step up and challenge Chrissy because she really was blowing everyone out of the water. And I felt like they were looking to me like, maybe you can do something here. <laughs> Nobody else can. Like, Nobody's and, having and much I, luck here. And obviously we had really big expectations, but to come here and, and have other people look at me and say, hey, 
I mean, that's great. You're you could be the next hope for for um, you know someone who could challenge Chrissy and make a race out of this thing. So um, I felt like there was a lot of more expectations than I than I anticipated. And you were okay with that. In the end, I was okay with it. I didn't realize at the time, but I, I've become an athlete that really races well under pressure. When it's the most important race, when the you know when everyone's looking to you to perform, somehow I've been able to perform on the right. biggest stage. And um, yeah, I, I welcome the pressure now. I I thrive on it. And so you take second that first year. Yep. And then the following year, 2010, you win. Morning of the race, Chrissy Wellington, three-time champion, undefeated at the Iron Distance, is sick, pulls out. Mm -hmm. Siri says, she gets a call. Yeah. He's like, you got to get down here. You got to get down here. And he's like, Chrissy dropped out of the race. Yeah. What do I do? Yeah, I, um, Siri had gone off to the bathroom or something. And I was, <laughs> it was my second Ironman. 2010 was my second Ironman ever. And I was in really good shape. And every, all year I prepared to race Chrissy. Okay, I'm going to race Chrissy. This is what I need to do. This is how it's going to play out. All the scenarios had been played out in my mind, except that Chrissy wasn't going to be on the start line. Uh, yes. And so all of a sudden, I like my, my husband now, husband at the time, he was just um, my boyfriend. He said it looked like um, I'd seen a ghost. My face was all white, and I was just like, well, "What now?" And uh, my manager, I think, called Siri and said, get, "Get back down here. You know, you need to talk to Rinny." Um, but yeah, she just said, "Nothing changes. You've prepared beautifully for this race. You've had a great year. You're in amazing shape, the shape of your life. Race your race." race how we've prepared you and, and you'll have a great day and I had one of those amazing days I actually had the swim in my life I've never swum that well since and, <laughs> and prior to I, I got out with the front pack and I'm like well this is a bit weird um, and my day was a lot easier getting out with the front pack girls what a surprise yeah massive surprise normally uh, it's four minutes or so yes. to the front front girls and I've got to sort of you know start there and start making up my time from there but this day I got out with with all the contenders and um, yeah, it was, it was a dream day. How did it change your life, winning that race that day? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, you, you kind of, you can't really express what it feels to win this race, first of all. Um, and coming in as kind of still felt like a rookie and having so much great success, you know, second in my first year, first in my second year. It was all just a dream come true, really. And s stuff of fairy tales. Um, and yeah, I mean, sponsorship changes i'm um eric for who was um the head of k-swiss at the yes. time k-swiss had just come into the sport in a big way and they had some big checks that they were happy to ride athletes and he he climbed over the barrier after the race and and said to me who's your manager i, I want to sponsor you next year and 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 i'm like he climbed over the barrier yeah, yeah he was he was at the finish up, up in the stands and he climbed over and and got down there he's like i'm eric for i'm k-swiss i want to sponsor you next year and i'm like this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's lots of other opportunities. Yeah. Travel the world. Why don't you come here? Why don't you come there? And after all those years, why wouldn't you take that? That's why you do the sport. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you take the sport to try and win big races and, and to perform on the biggest stage. But to be able to, you know, as a, as a kid, you're, you dream about having sponsors and, you know, shoes turn up to your door and having all those products turn up to your door and, and then I was getting, I was living my fantasy. So, um, yeah. What, what was the coolest thing that, that you got to do after winning Ironman World Championship? Um, I mean, I, I feel like I've had so many really cool experiences. My cho the chocolate milk ad that I did, yes. um, I think a couple of years later, um, that was just kind of crazy. I, I turned up on the set and um, I had my own trailer. They're like, oh, Miss Carfrey, yes, come to this trailer. And uh, that was just surreal, um, you know. I, I felt like a movie star for, for a hot minute. Um, so, yeah, things like that. Like, you'd never experience that in normal no. life. So, um, yeah, little things like that. There are obviously, you know, little perks that come along with it. But the greatest experience is, is crossing the finish line in first place. Yes. And on a Lee Drive here, um, from, for me, I mean, not for everyone in the world, but for me, that's my dream come true. And that's the best experience in the sport. As I remember leading into... 89 Ironman, Dave Scott, Mark Allen wanted nothing to do with each other. I tried to do a photo shoot. Dave was in Boulder. Right. And Dave was in Davis and Mark was in, in Boulder and I wanted to do a photo shoot and they wouldn't appear together. You're living in Boulder, mm -hmm. swimming in the same pool with Chrissy. Yeah. Dave Scott coaches the swim group, yeah. which you're part of, but also coaches Chrissy. Yeah. How tense was that leading? Because now you're the 
reigning champion. Mm -hmm. Chrissy's the three-time champion, mm -hmm. undefeated. Yeah. And you guys are going to be hitting head-to-head -head yeah. coming in 2011. Could you guys be friends? Could you be... No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> None of the above. Oh, no. I don't, well, I, I never met Chrissy until I raced her here. And so from the get-go, you know, I, she finished first that year. I finished second. So all of a sudden, like, okay, I'm a competitor. And, and she's a competitor to me. So I never wanted to be her friend. Um, I, I prefer to, you know, I race better against people I don't like. <laughs> and that's not to say I don't like Chrissy. I just never got to really know her. Now right. I know her and uh, it's a lovely, lovely woman. <laughs> yes. um, um, I could be friends with her now. We could sit down and have a, have a dinner together. But um, no, at the time, I didn't have any interest in becoming friendly with yeah. her. And, and I don't think she had any interest in becoming friendly with me. It's not... It wasn't that I didn't like her. It was just that she was a competitor and she was standing in the way of me winning a world title. And exactly. It is what it is. <laughs> so with, with all the opportunities in 2010, leading into 2011, um, you, the feeling was, you've, you've said it, that I didn't quite put my nose to the grindstone for, for that race as much as I should have. And Chrissy came in compromised after a bike crash and you ended up being down by about two minutes at the end. Right, which I, I'm guessing was, you know, you look back at it and go, well, I wouldn't pass up any of those opportunities, no. right? And that was the byproduct. Yeah, um, as we were talking earlier, winning the world title here in Kona, I wanted to enjoy everything that came along, all the perks that came along. I didn't know if it would ever happen again, of course. at that point. You, you don't know what the future holds. And, and so I thoroughly enjoyed that world title and celebrated that world title um, as it should be celebrated. Um, and so 2011, I didn't, I know I didn't prepare to the best of my ability. And so going into the race, um, you know, I was in great shape, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't in perfect shape. And yeah. I didn't do everything perfectly. I did a I was a little bit too much travel throughout the year, a little bit too many commitments. Um, and that, that wears on you by the end of the year. And um, yeah, that you look back and you're like, well, I probably wouldn't do anything differently because I made the decisions with what I knew at the time. Sure. Um, but in hindsight, you're kind of like, damn it, like, I wish I'd prepared just a little bit more um, the way I did in, you know, For leading third, in yeah. in 10 and in 13. And I think it might have been a bit different. But again, Chrissy didn't have the perfect day. Neither of us got our perfect day um, here on the island racing each other. So um, it wasn't to be, but yes. um, I've still had some incredible other performances racing against the other girls. Oh, yeah. no question about it. And the, the interesting part, too, is after that race... Okay, it's on to 2012. Let's focus. Yeah. Now I'm going to go knock that Chrissy off. And then she ups and retires. Yeah. Which you're somebody who's motivated by raising the best. Yeah. And now the person who's, you know, who's had that crown yeah. isn't coming back. Yeah. W was, was it hard to get motivated? It really was. In 2012, um, I actually left Siri, my coach. Yes. Because um, I just felt like I needed to make a big change. I wanted to be a Uber biker. Uh, yes. Everyone says, oh, she can run, but she can't bike and she can't swim. And I'm like, well, no, I can, I can swim all right. I mean, I'm not the best swimmer and I'm not the best cyclist, but I, I felt that the most time could be gained on the bike. Yes. Um, at that point, I was running about 252. Yes, I can run faster than that, but I can bike a lot faster. And so um, I went to a bike specialist coach and I worked with him. And um, But, yeah, motiva motivation was tough because, obviously, I wanted to knock Chrissy off her you know, off the off the top top pedestal, yeah. and, um, and she wasn't racing anymore. Yes. So then I was like, well, you know, that's not. I feel like it's not cocky to say that I I felt like I could beat all the other girls because um, I had beaten all the other girls. But it was just having that extra motivating factor. That can I beat Chrissy? I don't know if I can beat Chrissy, but I'm going to do everything I can to try and get there and try and challenge her. And um, she was gone, so it was more. It was like, well. What now? What do I use to get up in the morning now? And um, yeah, I mean, I still did all the training, but that little extra bit wasn't there. Um, that little extra bit of excitement, I yes. guess you could say, wasn't wasn't there as much. And I'm um, not having Siri as well. It was a weird year. Um, obviously, she'd been my coach since I came to Kona, so it was it was weird being on the island and she was coaching my competitors and and not having her. And obviously, right. that year Leander won. Um, who Siri was coaching. Who Siri was coaching. So it was it was just a, a weird year, and I ended up going back to Siri. Um, Which was a great move. It was a great move, but it was also I w also don't regret having that time away. You needed um, that. I need a little time away. It was like a, a little a little breakup in our relationship, and we got back <laughs> together, and we were stronger than ever. We won the 
the next two world titles in 13 and 14. Well, and 13 was that perfect day, right? Th 13 where, was, yeah. Yeah, we're just... Amazing. Yeah, now it, it, you just gotten engaged at that point? Exactly, yeah. Tim and I got engaged in the year before, actually. We got engaged uh, in 12, and then we were getting married like two months after um, 13. So, And Tim actually finished fifth that, that day as well in the men's race. So it was just a great day for our family, and um, f personally it was a really good performance. You know, I, I always look at that day and say that was my perfect day on the island so far. And that's where you launched yourself, right? Where you launched yourself into Tim after, when yes. he's standing at yeah, the finish right. line. If yeah. you haven't seen that photo or video, Tim has just finished the Ironman, just yeah. finished the fifth place, the best place he's ever done. And here comes this missile <laughs> coming across the finish line and basically jumping in the air, and he had no option, yeah. right? He, he had to catch me. He either yeah. caught you or he died. Yeah, no, he, he caught me, and we didn't go over, so he did a good <laughs> job. He was like, my hamstrings, my glutes were like, locked up but he's, he's pretty happy he held held on that's great and then you come back in 14 and you have that amazing 14 30 down and, and win that race when you look at everything you've accomplished on this island what what is it about this place that's so perfect for you i'm not sure i think um well growing up in brisbane australia is it's hot it's like a hot box in in the summertime down there and i think it's hotter than here so growing up in in that heat i think that helps um being a smaller athlete helps, uh, but I don't know. I, I just love racing here. I love racing in the heat, um, and I love the big stage that, you know, they they put you on here, and you're able to race against the best in the world in hopefully their best shape. I, I just love that platform. Love it. How about a round of applause for the amazing three-time Ironman world champion and mom, Miranda Carfrey, Pancho Man. It's Aloha Friday. Everybody in the morning. What? And it's breakfast with Bob and Miranda. Yeah. And Izzy. Yeah. And Izzy. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for being here all week. So many of you were here all week. Thanks so much. Hopefully, I didn't put you to sleep too often. It was awesome, and a huge thank you to EAS, Myoplex, Polar, Hoka, One, One Velofix, Norma Tech, Four Seasons Wildlife, Aero Power Breather. We will be at the Four Seasons on Sunday with our championship edition. Hopefully, Rini and Tio will be there yeah, yeah. with Izzy. We, we our fingers crossed on that. And again, thanks, everybody, for being with us. You guys are the best. <laughs>